Thanks, and, guys. And, and Ryan, have a great weekend. And Francis Hunt, welcome to FACE. Looking forward to having a conversation with you. Been following you on Twitter for quite some time. Even Blake says he's been following you for years. So uh, waiting to hear your voice. Hey, how are you, how, how are you guys? Uh, hey, thank you very much for having me on. Delighted to be oh, here. Oh, it's great to have you, Sniper. <laughs> thank you. All great right. So <laughs> uh, if you want to share your screen, um, you can do that. Have you been on Zoom before? I'm sure everyone's used Zoom. Yeah. And if you want to be on camera and let people see you, that too. I, I I tend to do that, yeah. Okay, that's okay. Oh, I, I, yeah, I, I didn't as long shave. as they don't uh, criticize my fashion sense, I'll I'll survive All it. Right. I, think. I didn't shave, but that's okay. <laughs> it's Friday. You know, we're traders. So, uh, Francis, really uh, great to meet you. And uh, Thank you, you know, yeah, you know, I've been to your uh, website, and uh, I don't know, many years ago, I, I may have been sending the emails uh, when I was looking for a gig. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I hit up everybody. So um, what I'd like to do before we get to the markets real quickly, Francis, is uh, why don't you tell us about your genesis as a trader or entree into the uh, industry, into the trading industry? How did it start for you? Oh, absolute pleasure. Yes, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, it was love at first bite, Dale. Um, yeah, I, uh, it, like you, although not quite to the extent as you, I think uh, you've always got to respect old warriors in a career <laughs> where the men die young. Um, but like you, I started early. Um, my uh, parents uh, were in Africa. My father was an Englishman, my mother a Frenchman, and uh, you know they had various bequests come their way when their parents passed on, and they invested during uh, into mutual funds during the equity bull market of the eighties. Okay, yeah. And I had an aunt who never married, who and I was one of many nieces and nephews, and I got a, I was very lucky. I got a couple of thousand pound, um, which was a lot of money in those days, uh, and it was nineteen eighty seven. And uh, I'd listen to my parents doing, you know, essentially checking the newspapers because that's what you did for prices right. uh, back then on the likes of Old Mutual and Guard Bank, which were big prominent uh, mutual funds uh, in South Africa at the time. And, you know, my father was driving from one big city to another, about 45, 60 Ks, and they were uh, every day to work. And I was seeing that they were reporting making almost more money with this bull market than they were earning. And I always liked that idea, you know, it was uh, love at first bite uh, in terms of working smart over hard. So I'm driven by laziness, in essence, um, quality of decisions uh, that can make you, uh, put you in the right direction. And of course I put all my bequests into the market. I was drafted into the army. It was compulsory at the time um, in August of 1987. So I put 100% of everything into the mutual fund market to catch the uh, crash of 1987, which I'm, a few, I'm sure as a historian, you'll have your own um, experience of that and it'll be one you'll remember well. So I got a 40% plus haircut um, literally within weeks uh, of everything I owned, which was basically close to 100% of my net worth at that time. Um, so that's why I say love at first bite because it's a bit yeah. hard. Through the fire right away. Uh, you know, a veteran pulled me aside, Francis, uh, uh, when I was getting my seat um, at the CME. And he said, kid, this is a tough way to make an easy buck. And uh, he was <laughs> he was definitely right. So, and it's a good memory because I was a kid then. So, <laughs> yeah, one time I too was a kid. So uh, yeah. thank, thanks for that. Uh, Francis, you know, uh, it was one of our attendees that made the request that I bring you on. And I know you have markets here, but uh, her um, desire was to hear your narrative on the Great Reset. And I'm sure some of the markets that you're going to be showing us are, are, are part of it. But, um, you know, I'd be interested in uh, what your concept is of the Great Reset. A lot of people talk about it, but a lot of people have different uh, scenarios for the Great Reset. What are you looking for? Wow, that's such a broad and great question. It's an outstanding one and it encompasses everything. So yeah. um, if I was the trader animal, 
I would be the thermaling eagle. We all think we're eagles. Nobody ever is a warthog or a, an earthworm. Um, we're all eagles and lions. Um, but I would certainly be. Uh, I, I say, don't be a pigeon. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And oh, and also, by the way, uh, your video box. I'm not seeing your your image. I see the square. Yeah, it's telling me uh, it's blocked. Uh, you cannot start oh. your video as a host. Of Steve, are it. you there? Can you unblock uh, Francis's uh, video, yes, please? Yes, already done. Here? Oh, you've done it. So, uh, okay, try it again, Francis. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, there we go. Now. Okay, it's now, now you're with me. Okay, that's it. Let's get. Thank this you, straight. Steve. No problem. Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. So tr the the grand macro. Um, so I, I'm cursed with too many I, I, economies and trading fascinate me intrinsically. Um, so I'm a grand macro technical analyst my specialist skill. So I like looking at big time frame charts, uh, particularly. Uh, and I've also specialized in creating a particular methodology that sets an immense amount of uh, cones that have to be lined up before you put on a trade. In other words, my worldview and experience is people have too frivolous a number of reasons for putting on a trade. You need to trade less to make more. Yes. Um, so less being more, and you need a multitude more uh, reasons. This implies patience. It's not only patience isn't just sitting around. It's what you do while you're sitting around. You've got to learn, line, line up and analyze. So I do my hours of charting per trade is substantially higher than anybody else's. Uh, that I know um, on the basis that we look 360 de degree analysis, we look at antagonist markets, correlated markets. Um, we see how it fits into this grand macro. So I have a kind of wall room in my head of where I think the world is going um, because that has steered me in a number of very accurate directions. Um, by the way, I get a lot wrong, but I'm just going to steer you to what might sound like a flattering statement. So I want to absolutely confirm that I get as much wrong as I get right as any, any of the other guys. But the grand macro view saw us be very bearish oil in the 60s, and it was supported by our grand macro technical. And 360 degree analysis saw us also feel similarly short about oil companies as we mine the seam, think of it almost as that horrific activity of fracking, which is so unfriendly. Not only do we do go down, we go horizontally along um, and we frack the market in terms of our analysis. So we were looking at uh, tallow oil. I was looking at Plains All American Pipeline um, all around the commodity trade idea long before any trades were put on. And we kept finding technically that we felt equally bearish all of them. Uh, the story I mentioned is that we had a similar feeling with Carnival, the uh, cruise liner, which was bizarre because it has oil as an input. And if we're bearish oil as the commodity, why would uh, a cruise liner, which apart from staffing, probably has its second biggest cost in uh, burning grease to keep floating. Um, and as a result, we got the answer in the form of the pandemic. So I have truly trust the footprints in the sand, the charts before news. Most people say I don't trade news, but they're always still thinking fundamentally when they yes. should. Uh, absolutely. I call it almost ignorance is bliss fundamentally. You almost want to have a news block out and look for themes the difficult way backwards. And there's some great authors in the state side. I'm, I'm showing up on your morning. Uh, I'm not in America at the moment, but Stephen Covey, you'll know, he, also, yeah. he said, begin with the end in mind and work back. Um, so I, I go say, what is the technical of interest to me on a big time frame? Because I'm not a day trader. I think you should do less um, and do more analysis. And I pick up the grand stories and I picked up a short interest in oil. We'd previously caught it in July 14. Should probably bring up uh, the US. Uh, so w this is recent, the recent uh, WTI top that we had a failing rally this week uh, that you're negative oil again. No, no, sir. Uh, oh, let me. That was I'll, back. I'll, I'll, that was back a year and a half. I'm ago. giving you history now. Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm okay. giving you history that led into. So to, it, I would not characterize. In fact, we are, we have flipped now, and yeah, I will okay. bring you up to date as part of the process of this. I'm just going to okay. remove the log scale because it makes because oil yeah, spiked yeah. to zero, yeah, it spoils does, the chart. The same. Yeah. Um, so if I'm just showing you this, this is a macro falling wedge. And if I were yeah. to summarize how you, your question was, and I must answer the question is, 
uh, or give you at least a feel for how you answer such a broad question is that by being grand macro, I essentially, and I, I like you, I love to, uh, to teach and illustrate. Um, I'm going to just grab a pen here and I'll just highlight. Essentially, I grew up in this era of relatively stable oil prices you say relatively stable the low end is 10 to 15 and the high end was sort of 30 to 35 around about the greenspan era in my worldview we started to leak to the upside greenspan came in in 87 we started to become more yeah. upward bias we went totally liquidity orientated in the dot-com so after the dot-com bust uh, particularly in the States, you went into a recession the UK managed to miss, which is where I was at the time. But there was a big fear of deflation because there was such a, a, a loss of valuation. Remember, even Amazon fell from over $100 yeah, yeah. to around six or seven, uh, and the rest died entirely. Um, right. So there was a lot of liquidity provided. That's where you get that rising wedge that I've drawn. And you broke out of this range that was our medium. I tend to put a splitter, that's the orange line in everything I do. So I like to determine ranges. That then, if we're talking about oil, which I know is a market you like, you cover FX uh, and the big indices. So we, we're keeping it here. So it's relevant, hopefully, for the bulk of your audience. This turned into the big bull period right. for oil as a result of excess liquidity in the macroeconomic system. So um, I don't want to ever offend anyone. This is just my take. Don't get provoked. Um, but I treat, so some people might think that's a bit cons conspiratorial and you're a weirdo or a tin foil hat. Weather. To me, oil is the first global tax. I call it the Rockefeller tax. Because when we got the property boom, one of the things that taxed everybody, no matter which country you're in, was the increase uh, in oil price. So... Whether you think that there are still monopolies or big interests, I won't go there. That's a, a different, more reset -y type uh, discussion. This was a huge bull surge. Right. Parabolic. That came. And actually, you, you went up to around 145. This entire falling wedge is our corrective. So I, I've seen that you also have some good electricians. You've got some amazing guys, by the way, in your community. I was checking out your site. Really cool. Um, this would be kind of, for the electricians, this would be your first corrective leg in this entire falling wedge. Um, and we were engaged in calling a short there. Um, and we were lucky because we were initially wrong. So again, I want to always say we get just as much wrong as the next guy, but we flipped at the key moment. So we had what we call a squeeze. So our methodology is very, very focused on a very tight volatility based event. This, and uh, you've totally got this because I was listening to a lot of your material, is you don't just take you know, someone traded before a non-farm and you said, yes, you got lucky because it went Euro USD on a binary event. It's absolutely correct. What you really want to do if you're going to take a, a risk on direction is you want to have an asymmetric potential upside for a very clearly defined limited risk to the downside. So even if it turns out a 50-50 or even a 60-40 against, if you're getting five R's to the upside and sacrificing only one to the downside, the long run, those opportunities pay you net. Uh, and you eat your losses as it's just the next one until I get one of the fives on the, the correct side. So we are initially, we're expecting upside continuation because our default is continuation. So I'm quite Newtonian in that sense. Things keep moving until an equal and opposite force starts to act on them and overcomes the initial force. So our default position is continuation. Too many folks, I think, try to trade reversals. Small sidebar for those that do use indicators like RSI and other things. It does have a tendency, if you're not adjusting for that, to encourage top calling and bottom picking. Because an RSI going from one end to another end, you now automatically assume it has to immediately return back down to the other side. An RSI can stay high and even come off a little bit and you can remain in a bull run and similarly in a bear scenario. So watch that. We initially were assuming continuation. Then we there was the whole Ukraine war heating up and this thing wasn't moving. And we set our final level and we flipped and we went short there. And we were shocked by the amount that this sold off. 
because it actually took out the subprime low that I'm highlighting. So we had an over, we had a target down at 60. And we thought we'd leave a little bit on. We were totally closed out and the market kept falling. And that was almost like a losing trade <laughs> in some senses. You know, you feel opportunity cost should also be seen sometimes as loss. And I, I sat back and I thought, why didn't, um, why did we get out so early with 60K, uh, $60 oil being uh, early. And we realized this was an overperformance event. You went into the China over indebtedness and a bit of a crash, the Shanghai Accord, um, when China effectively became as indebted as all the other coordinated and synchronized other central bank driven major economies. So you have, whether you're in Australia, London, the US, and now in the East, and of course, Japan was there before everyone else. And this Francis, is. Francis, uh, I just want to say we have 14 minutes left on the interview. I don't want to spend the sure. majority on history. No. Uh, I, I wonder if we could get in the time machine and uh, uh, get to get to today and sure. where we are today in. And, what and, your and are you happy are for it to be on oil? Are you looking for an opinion on this or would you like to transition? Uh, to you know, I, I want to know what your concept is for the Great Reset and how people should prep for it and uh, uh, what markets they should be paying attention to. Um, and, you know, uh, that's the reason I, I brought you on is uh, sure. Hannah wanted you to talk about the Great Reset. So, you know, uh, the key markets will be the universal markets like oil. Uh, okay. debt, debt markets, which I'll show you very quickly because we'll skip past each one just on a fly pass basis because okay. we won't have time to do deep dives. Um, this is your macro 10-year yield. Yeah. I'm just going to hide my annotations. might uh, overwhelm people initially because I have a lot of drawers that I keep on. So this is yield on debt. My right. hypothesis is that people's appetite for government-based debt is diminished. Uh, and that the 40-year bull market in bonds that spanned my, my older brother's entire bond trader career um, is probably over and that the COVID uh, event was the bookmarking end for that. Right now, okay. you are actually getting the yields come back down a, uh, a little bit on the 10-year, so it might seem incorrect. But when you log scale this, this percentage-based capitulation and I've heard you mention this before. It's very typical of ending trend events. It's like a blow off at a top and it's like yeah. a final capitulation at a bottom. So I'm sticking my neck out and saying debt market is a turn. This is another key market to be observed. So we're saying okay. oil, oil long run up. You might have a little return move because of that falling wedge. Supposedly people believing the Fed will tighten all of that little return move, long run up and even all time highs beyond those highs. So okay. two big macro calls to big markets to watch. What other markets to watch? Well, the dollar and of course, precious metals. So uh, with fiat, let's, I'll, I'll take you to the Dixie uh, and I'm gonna highlight something here uh, as well. I'll just un unlock those drawers for you. This is the dollar index. So again, very macro. This of, of yeah. course includes a lot of the Euro and then the Swiss and the pound and some of the others. So it's not a perfect match for all other currencies. This is a falling wedge that we've already broken out of. That breakout event was the, the, uh, came a lot later. So from a lot earlier, apologies, 2008 was the low and 2014, you broke out of this wedge and you returned. And we're now in some form of a structure. There's a, there's a gentleman that talks about the dollar milkshake theory. His name's Brent Johnson. Go have a chat uh, with him. He may be right. I think he was early, which many people will say is wrong, but I think in the long run, a smart guy who's wrong is worth listening to because he may long run be right. So in the, the realm of fiats, we collapse from the smaller inward is my hypothesis. So the likes of the Rand, the Lira roll over and, then they, uh, and the others get forced up as that money has to first run into other fiats with the dollar being the, the, the key in the middle. So that's another reset. So we've spoken about dollar. We've spoken about oil. We've shown okay, you- So a higher money. dollar uh, that we follow through from this breakout, we've had a few retests of that um, wedge. And do you think we could have another retest here or the recent lows that we have here, uh, a dollar rally is underway and the milkshake theory is talking about like a 120 Dixie, isn't it, uh, Francis? People I'm not about sure that. what Brent's latest prediction is. Don't quote me, so I'd rather not yeah. say. Okay. Um, but it's way up there. By the way, it's not going to be your best trade because you're trading one flawed weak currency against an even more flawed, smaller weak currency. Okay. So yeah. always position. 
um, a beauty queen against an ugly, the ugliest dog in uh, in, in, the, in the pound. Um, yeah. don't, don't trade uh, slightly less ugly t- against an ugly uh, puppy. Take take your beauty queen. Um, so this is more something to observe as part of the process of potential fiat failure, dollar okay. strengthening. If it goes up too fast, too soon, things get disorderly super quick because yeah. Turkey overly indebted. They're already at 19% interest rates trying to pretend that we traded the USD lira very, very successfully for the last decade. I'm nearly always to the long side, apart from after the blow off, we shorted because they put their rates so high. We had such a beautiful carry um, by just holding the trade open. And then it pulled back quite substantially. So what's your carry cost? A quick note on that. Last year on a single account, I had 180,000 uh, pounds just in trading costs, holding open trades. That was wow. financing uh, all sorts yeah. of things. And that was a huge percentage of the profit for the year. Uh, you truly need to recognize it. Admittedly, I had some lira uh, at very high interest there, and it was about 50% of that. But if you took all of that out, and I never traded lira, you would still have 90,000 pounds um, of open carry costs. Do you do your PL at the end of your year where you tally how much it's cost you just to be in the game uh, and hold those open positions? Great we point. Time stops. We kill trades if they aren't doing what we expect to do. You may have a stop and you may have a target, but what if they... Uh, vacillate somewhere in between and you start to portfolio do not portfolio trades do not huddle and hold on to trades you get comfy seeing it in your blotter it's like an old friend every morning you open it up and it's there no 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 the carry cost you're missing this you're not reading your statements time stops it must do what you expect it to do in the time otherwise new forces have come in and are countervailing so cull interesting all right uh and with conviction so uh, uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, of course, that you're probably looking at uh, gold is not being um, yes. an let's inflation take you to the shiny stuff. Yeah, let's yeah. take you to the shiny stuff. The yeah. interesting thing, and this has a 360 degree analysis point on it. So I'll bring up the gold futures, which everyone will recognize. And of course, that's against the dollar. However, the best technical setups that came out of this was actually on the um, euro and the pound. Be- remember, you, especially if you're US-based, you're so comfortable with everything being ba- benchmarked against your home con- currency. It's always about that. You forget that there's a footprint and a movement in your own currency. Uh, it is not the stake in the ground that is stable and everything else is on a chain walking around it. You've got to look at it versus other currencies. And this is part of our 360 degree value thinking. So actually looking at the pound gold and the euro gold gave us this uh, structural setup that saw us when we called that short on the oil side, we were saying simultaneously because we were measuring gold's value in oil barrels. And we thought it was ridiculously low, too few oil barrels to buy an oil, uh, to buy an ounce of gold. We said, not only should you be shorting the oil into what ended up the coronavirus, which was clearly exceptional events, you should also be long the gold at the same time. And that took off in the beginning of 19 and made its targets as you were going into COVID there in March of 20. Yeah. So not only did we nail this, and this is just something that we got right on that occasion. As I say, we get lots wrong. But you, you, by doing the 360 analysis, you could see, great, I will close my dollar-based gold trades when the gold euro and gold pound met their targets. And that's exactly what we did. Because we want the liquidity of the gold against the dollar, the tighter spreads, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't stop you from doing t- TAs on a different benchmark. The euro was very the same. I barely changed the drawing. I wiped the face. You can see it's pretty similar. The euro. Yeah. And this is a classic macro constriction. Range bound, you have your blow off, yeah. you have your pullback, your second impulse, your third, then you rest, and then you go. That was your trade. That's on a log scale. It doesn't look impressive. Let me just refresh you by a delogging the scale so that everyone can see. It was a substantial move. But like everything, you must take off. That was the move you caught. And that is when our, our targets were all met. And within a, literally days, the gold market actually had a longer than most of us, certainly what I expected, pullback. And it's still not fully 
uh, done gestating. So the value right. of leverage is you must have a target and a takeoff point. There's a difference between invest. I invest in silver and gold. I hold it. I don't care on the daily price, the weekly price, the monthly moves generally, because that's a fundamental long term. When you're borrowing money and you have carry costs, time matters. You must have a point where you take off. If it doesn't perform, you have a time stop as well as a loss stop. So those, those are key messages that I would deliver. And that's part of okay. our, our, our major message. All right. Regarding precious metals, you know, we had that uh, tremendous move in the gold silver ratio when you could have turned in one ounce of gold for 110 ounces of silver. And uh, that's come in. It's trying to trade above 68. Uh, looks like it's trying to correct. Are you expecting uh, in this great reset for silver to continue to outperform gold or will people go to the monetary metal ahead of the semi-precious industrial metal? So how you finish there is how the, the, the precious bull market start. Once they've properly got going, how the, then it pivots to the higher beta silver outperforming, um, generally in our, our worldview. And again, with the pandemic uh, example where you had both Bitcoin, you had gold and silver collapse uh, into the, the pandemic and you had silver actually trade $11 um, yeah. in that low. That was a final capitulation. So in the, the same sense that I mentioned, it was a book ending event. Essentially, you shut down the globe. Um, so gold and silver had their final capitulations in our view, particularly silver. And that's where you got the gold silver ratio spike. I've actually done it on the futures and you and uh, you traded over 128 um, in oh, terms yes. of how many ounces there. So I've taken the gold future as per the, the continuous contract and divided it by the silver. So it's exceptional. So we were screaming again, uh, this was a macro rising wedge, which was the financialization of everything. And often in wedges, you get a final blow off. We call that a type two. Uh, so normally wedges, you'll know technically they break down, um, but sometimes you get a final pop uh, out yeah. and you, they go- I call them throwovers. Correct. So our right. phraseology might be different, but we're yeah. surely talking about the same That thing. was a hell of a throwover. Yeah. And it was an opportunity to be seized. Um, okay. And so in there, we said, that is your big bull. Now what's happened, the key level is 70. Uh, at the moment, and we are kind of doing a counter trend rally. And that yeah. kind of dovetails with the Fed's current positioning. No, we will act on inflation, we'll up rates, we'll wind back the balance sheet. People are buying that to a degree. Uh, generally, I don't um, think anything meaningful and significant or sustainable. We've been in this position before. So I'm a bluff caller when I listen to central bankers talk on that. They will never settle that balance sheet in my worldview. So overall, you may get a rally, but I want to be short again the gold silver ratio, which being means being aggressively long silver and moderately okay. long gold. Got it. Uh, how will equities fare uh, in this environment? Can uh, will they be a good, uh, great reset hedge, or is this the time to be thinking about raising cash? Cash is going to devalue uh, in an inflationary environment. My, okay. my model is pretty much uh, going uh, inflationary. Uh, I also fear if we ha we do have supply chain shortages, there will be black markets. People are going to have to pay more for food and basics and staples. That'll only push uh, inflationary up. And everyone will say, well, it's transitory. It's only because of X, Y, Z. Right. Ignore the reasons. There's always a reason something goes yeah. up. It's inflationary. Yeah. Is the number up? It's inflationary. Not because so-and-so said whatever. So I'm an in inherently inflationist. So cash long run, being liquid during a deflationary event will give you opportunities to catch uh, the counter trend and get in a better position into silver, get into a better position into various other things. But long run, I want to be invested in unprintable assets that have uh, that would be, you know, precious metals, agris, land, various other elements that you can choose. If you're a crypto guy and you believe Bitcoin is restricted in number, then it can be crypto. Uh, those are those alternatives. I do not want to be long term in cash. However, that doesn't mean I'm saying to you right now, don't have cash. Because if we have a super deflationary event, there's a global hack that occurs. Everybody, some money gets stolen, lost, written off, you know, Russia, Korea, Korea North Korea is blamed, etc. If you get an event like that. Um, we'd have another event similar to the, um, the COVID. So okay. all of those, you need to be liquid to exploit. Everyone would have loved to have bought the silver at $11, I'm imagining, and the equities yeah. that are miners in that space. 
that's your opportunity. So certainly you have ammunition dry to exploit, but the, you want to be committed with the big uh, inflationary trend. Fiat currency is being proliferated. It is not your friend long term. It's being compounded against you. Uh, position in fixed assets. Your question was about equity. So let me quickly answer it. Um, the key thing about equities, even though by all valuations, they are hopelessly overvalued, you know, PE ratios, all the various different ratios, when you divide it by M2, and I'm going to throw this up super quick for you, this is the amount of money that is being proliferated, um, the money stock, you will find uh, that actually by historical measures, it's not as extreme as it appears. If you compare it to the dot-com boom, you can see here's where we are. Unfortunately, that means valuations can get more perverted and okay. still relatively be value because we're comparing it to peanuts and there are more and more peanuts coming down the chute. Um, and as they diminish, your benchmark is not a true stable stake in the ground benchmark. Okay. It's fiat currency. Just uh, going in reverse of, uh, and to wrap, uh, how do you explain the underperformance of the golden mainly the gold miners uh, compared to the price of bullion. It's interesting Recently. that you mentioned that equity players have uh, are underperforming. I mean, I'm in first majestic on silver side. Uh, I'm also, uh, I will, I'll also add the oil. I'm long oil, but I mean, the claims all, yeah, yeah. I, but I'm also long a couple, uh, a couple of oil related equities and they are underperforming. So I've observed exactly what you, uh, you've observed. And I think that's the, because the money is still going into the grand exponential stocks, which are the growth, the data miners, the data farmers, AI. I think technology is a huge sucking vacuum in terms of equity, and it takes a lot of institutional flows. Uh, and as they become... Whereas gold miners, it would be like a garden hose, compressing and doesn't even need... Uh, you know, the market cap of all the gold shares out there is probably like IBM. Yeah, it's it's very right? low. It's very, yeah. very low. I think also some people are a bit green in green fear. You know, the activity of digging a big hole and churning up the earth is not nearly as well received in the new the new new. Who knows what carbon credits are going to be enforced on these types of activities coming? So there's a lot of undefined hazards that haven't been finalized. And in people's minds, they hate uncertainty. So if, if suddenly all these miners get told they have to buy a million dollars a month of carbon taxes to offset the damage they're doing to wherever they're digging, um, it's quite a thing. While could it all, work, Yeah, could it also be a fear of nationalization of mines in unstable areas like in Africa right now? Uh, ab absolutely. Uh, I, I don't okay. even think you have to go as far as Africa. It could happen okay. even in the States. You know, okay. uh, we, the American Oh, that's right. They've canceled, uh, you, that you weren't holding. What we have is a massive negative real interest rates. I have a chart, it'll take me too long to find for the time we have left. But okay. uh, if I just describe it, during the 70s, when you had negative real interest rates in terms of your inflation relative to right. what the bonds were yielding, Americans yep. couldn't own gold. Yeah. Uh, and it yeah, was I held remember. open, a temporary measure. So your ability to protect yourself as the land of the free was removed from you. Um, yeah. And... So bear that in mind. When I started in the business as a runner on the CME is when they made it available to the U.S. citizens again at 200 an ounce. It promptly dropped to 100. And then we had the bull market to 880 with the peaking with Hunt, Hunt Brothers and the uh, war in Afghanistan, Russia inv invading another country invading Afghanistan. So, you know, Francis, I'm so glad that uh, I want to thank Hannah for uh, recommending that I talk to you. Uh, and you know, you survived this interview with Flying Colors. Uh, do you know what happens uh, to people that do that? Uh, I'm about to find out. Uh, you become my trading warrior brother. Oh, I love that. I'm proud All to right? be <laughs> So, you know, you're much more than a sniper. Uh, you know, I, I think that you're, you know, you have some cannons. Uh, to fire to Francis. I really enjoyed talking to you. It was an excellent, uh, informative interview. All the attendees are making comments about it. And I want to thank you for spending your most valuable currency, which is time, to be with us today. Oh, absolute pleasure. And thank you for the work you do doing honest, straightforward, educating and supporting of traders in a, in a sea full of sharks. It's great to have uh, good straight up 
uh, gray beards um, taking people <laughs> down the straight and narrow. So good, good one on you. All right. Thank you, Francis. Have a great weekend, uh, everyone. That's a wrap, a great way to wrap it with Francis. You could join the team in 10 minutes. And remember, Francis, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. You could always find something to be grateful for. Indeed. And, and that's a wrap, everyone. Hope you had a good week. We laid it all out on the floor, bringing in great people like uh, Francis Hunt. And the best way for people to follow you, Francis, uh, I have your, your website. Uh, it's really nice. And at the Market Sniper on Twitter. That's it. TheMarketSniper.com and at the Market Sniper for traditional markets on Twitter. Thank you, buddy. Also YouTube. Thank all you right. very much. God all bless right. you. That, all right, everyone. Have a great uh, weekend. We'll see everyone. Monday and the team will see you in a little bit. Adios, everyone.